Chapter 15 We must find Father Tommaso right away, Francesco said as he brushed the straw from his shorts. With all the commotion, they nearly forgot to find out why he had sent Nina after them with this urgent message. With an eye to the orchard, the boys made their way along the old stone wall that wound its way around the, down the hillside and through the village of Avaletto. As they walked, Dominic looked over his shoulder and listened for the tinkle of donkey bells. His stinging back made him wary of meeting the giant again. Violetta trotted alongside Dominic and she nudged his leg with her nose. He smiled and reached out to pet her, glad for the chance to take his mind off his worries. Does she really eat anything? he asked Francesco, as she gently nibbled his fingers. She would eat herself to death if she could find f enough food, Salvatore quipped before Francesco could answer. I never let her g graze near poisonous plants, Francesco admitted. Goats are smarter than most animals, except when it comes to food and puddles. Puddles? Dominic asked. I have to keep her away from mud and puddles. She gets foot rot if she stands too long in a wet place, Francesco explained. Haven't you ever cared for animals? No, I've never had the chance, Dominic admitted sadly. I never lived in one place long enough, but I've had lots of imaginary pets. He went on to tell them about his imaginary dogs and kittens and the monkey he pretended he had. Antonio's cheeks dimpled as he grinned. I, too, dream about having a monkey some day. Soon Dominic found himself telling the boys about the family he wished he had. He had never told anyone about his dream family before, not even his caseworker. He didn't think other people would understand, and he was afraid that they might even laugh at him. But the Candiano brothers had no trouble understanding. The boys loved hearing Dominic's dream, especially the part about the warm brownies on the kitchen table. But first, Dominic had to explain just what a brownie was. Salvatore told Dominic about his dream family, which consisted of a cowboy father and a mother who made calamari, squid, every night for supper. The thought of having a cowboy father made Dominic smile, but the thought of having squid every night for, for supper didn't appeal to Dominic at all. I'd rather have a mother who made pizza, he thought. Dominic had never felt so content or comfortable trading dreams and stories with people. If only he weren't so hungry, everything would have been perfect. When they finally reached the cobblestone piazza, the village square, Dominic stood and stared. An ancient stone wall surrounded houses that leaned every which way, higgledy-piggledy along the cliff's edge. A jumble of red-tiled roofs dipped and dove as they connected one house to the next. A copper-colored rooster crowed loudly as he perched on a rooftop, while three snowy white hens looked on silently. In fairy tale fashion, the doorways and shutters of the old houses were splashed with color. Pink and red blossoms spilled over window boxes and balconies everywhere. An old man and donkey, carrying bundles of twigs, slowly clip clopped their way down one of the narrow cobbled streets. The air held the scent of wood smoke mixed with the pungent smells of rotting fruit fresh manure, and the faint fragrance of lemons. Dominic looked down, careful to sidestep the piles of horse manure that were everywhere. As they continued on, they turned down a winding street. It brought them to a large mulberry tree that grew in the center of a small courtyard. Sitting under the tree was a big, burly man plucking feathers from a goose. On seeing the boys, he jumped up, causing a cloud of goose feathers to follow all around him. The man wore a white apron over his long black robe. A pair of thick leather sandals were strapped to his bare feet. His big, balding head was fringed in dark ringlets, and his round face held the shadow of a day-old beard. Grazie a Dio! Thanks be to God, he said, still holding the goose by the crook of its skinny neck. He made a sign of the cross with his free hand. You're here at last. I've been looking all over for you. I guess you weren't looking in the right places, father, Antonio chirped. The priest laughed and ruffled Antonio's blonde curls. Dominic could see why the boys loved him so. A, as big and burly as he was, Father Tommaso was a sweet, gentle man. Francesco quickly introduced Dominic, but before he could explain his situation, they were interrupted by the priest. 
We have very little time, Father Tommaso said, tossing the goose into the basket by his stool and pulling off his apron. Come with me. They hurried after him into the small stone house that was attached to the church. Francesco crossed himself as they passed a statue that stood in a window sill. Salvatore and Antonio did the same. The clip-clapping of Violetta's hooves could be heard on the cool stone floors as she followed them through the small through a small kitchen and into a book-lined study at the rear of the house. Shoo, Vito, the priest said, ushering a rooster out of the room. Father, we want to ask you about our friend, Francesco began. Certainly, my son, Father Tommaso replied as he rummaged through a pile of papers on his desk. But first we must attend to this most important matter. Now, where did I put that paper? A feather fell from his robe as he bent over the desk. Ah, yes, here we are. This is what I've been looking for. He turned and gave the brother brothers a long, serious look. I promised your mamma, as she lay dying, with Antonio still a babe in her arms, that I would do what I could to find you a family, he said. With your papa gone before her and no other family to care for you, she didn't want you running like a pack of wild pups. Francesco reached up and smoothed down a cowlick on his unbrushed head, while Salvatore pulled Antonio's hand away from a scab he was picking on his arm. Even Violetta seemed to stifle a burp as she nibbled, nibbled on the raggedy frayed edges of Francesco's shorts. I'm afraid I couldn't keep my promise until now, the priest continued. What do you mean, Father? Francesco asked. Families, Father Tommaso said. Through the church's orphan fund in America, two families have been found for you. Your ship, the new Amsterdam, leaves from Napoli in two days' time. I know it's short notice, but the letter was held up in the mail. It only just arrived here yesterday morning from America. America! Salvatore exclaimed. Father, are you saying we're going to America? Yes, my son. I've found two Italian families who will sponsor you. One in, is in a place called New Jersey, and the other in New York. Father Tommaso smiled uneasily. Two families? Francesco's dark eyebrows furrowed. It is not the situation I would have wished for you, Father Tommaso sighed, but is the best we can do for now. We won't be separated, Francesco said firmly. I know you don't want to be apart, but you must be reasonable, Francesco, the priest pleaded. Who would be able to take in all three of you? That's three extra mouths to feed. We were lucky to find you one family from New Jersey who will take two of you and pay for your passage. The three brothers stood shaking their heads. No. If you don't take this opportunity, what will become of you? Father Tommaso tried to reason with them. Do you want to sleep on straw and starve for the rest of your lives? In America, you can go to school and learn trades. Will these families feed us in America? Antonio asked. Yes, little one, they will have plenty of food in America. It is my dream to go to America one day, father, Salvatore spoke up, but not if it means that I must be separated from my brothers. Our mamma wouldn't have wanted us to be apart, Francesco added. Your mamma wouldn't have wanted you to be hungry all the time either, father Tommaso pointed out. Look at yourselves. Do you really believe that your parents would have wanted this kind of life for you? To be dressed in rags? To be living in a barn? And to be stealing for your every meal? But we are a familia, Francesco told him. We stay together. That is what our mama and papa both would have wanted. Are you certain of this, my son? The priest asked gently. Francesco nodded his head. Yes, father, I am certain. Dominic breathed a sigh of relief, for he didn't know what would become of him if Francesco and the others were to leave him. Suddenly, there came a rapping on the little window behind the desk that startled them all. Father Tommaso turned around and unlatched the pane. Not now, Angelina, I'm busy, he called to the little stooped woman in black who waited for him. But father, the old woman insisted. Do not worry, Angelina, Father Tommaso assured her. I will get you the goose's neck for your pot in a minute. 
It's someone else's neck that you need to be worried about, the old woman replied. Something bad has happened, Father. You had better come right away. All right, all right, Father Tommaso shrugged. It's probably Spadoni's pig gotten out of his fence again and tearing up her basil. What am I to do about a pig who loves to eat basil, he grumbled as he hurried out the door. Stay put. I will be right back. He did return shortly, but the color had drained from his face. What is it, father? Salvatore asked on seeing the priest's stricken look. Did Spadoni's pig get loose again? No, it's not Spadoni's pig. It's Tibera Rendizzi, answered Father Tommaso, his voice full of disbelief. He's dead. Murdered. Murdered? Salvatore gasped. Yes, and they say they know who killed him. They're hunting for the murderer right now. Who? Salvatore asked. Who is the murderer? Father Tommaso paused, and then in a whisper, he said, It's you, my son. They say you killed Tibero Rendizzi.